Greetings, church, from the meeting house of the First Baptist Church in America to you wherever you may be this day. Thank you for taking the time to join us for this time of prayer and song and reflection. I'm grateful for the ways that we can virtually connect while we are physically distant from one another. In the midst of all of this, we continue to be the church, looking out for and loving on each other. We thank you for continuing to send your prayer requests by phone and message to the church office and to me. Our prayer tree is still in full effect. We thank you for ensuring that the work of church continues through your gifts. We are in the midst of our One Great Hour of Sharing offering. These gifts support disaster relief, development projects, refugee ministries of our American Baptist churches and our partners. Your generosity continues to help our brothers and sisters in these uncertain times, so thank you. If you would like more information about our congregation, please visit our church website at www.fbcia.org. It is our practice to share in the Lord's Supper together on the first Sunday of each month. And so this morning in all our varied places, we will come together and share in this meal. When Jesus shared this with his disciples, he told them to do this and remember. He didn't specify what particular kind of bread or beverage you need to have. And so I invite you now to pause this message and gather a a beverage and bread of your choosing, be it Welch's or fermented grape juice, coffee or tea or tap water, biscuit, baguette, naan. Go ahead, go get it. I'll wait. All right, welcome back. Beloved, we are in tumultuous times. For some of us, this is nothing new. Bigotry, business as usual. Others of us are seeing some things for the first time. And in the time that elapses from when I speak these words and when you hear them, a lot can change. We are in the midst of a revolution and we are tasked with both recognizing who we are and casting a vision for who we wanna become. Last week, we heard from the book of Acts and in it, Peter, in his sermon, references the prophet Joel who says that before the spirit of God pours out, people must first repent. The second chapter of the book of Joel, it says, Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and relents from sending calamity. Who knows? God may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. Part of our work now is to repent and to create something better from the wreckage around us, to pull something more lovely from this chaos. This past week in Rhode Island, following days of peaceful demonstration and a night of destruction, people showed up the next day to help strangers and neighbors sweep up glass and cover busted windows. They put on their masks and they rolled up their sleeves and they got to work. Rend your hearts and return to God. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old will dream dreams and your young will see visions. I will pour out my spirit in those days. Friends, we stand in need of prayer now more than ever. So I invite you now to find a posture of prayer and join me in a word. Make yourself comfortable. I invite you to soften your eyes Feel the difference between a clenched jaw or a fist, a deep exhale or an open palm. Breathe in the breath of God and breathe out your anxiety. Breathe in God's inspiration. And breathe out your grief. Breathe in God's peace and breathe out your fury. Breathe in God's love and breathe out fear. Let God's spirit permeate your being. and Repeat as needed until you are able to breathe in love and exhale this same love. 
Loving God, your desire is for our wholeness and well-being. We hold in tenderness and prayer the collective suffering of our world at this time. We thank you for your presence, your protection and provision in more ways than we can articulate or even know. God, you know the shape of our joy and our grief. You are intimately familiar with our sorrows and our fears. And we thank you for meeting us where we are. We grieve precious lives lost and vulnerable lives threatened. We repent for the perpetuation of systems and stigmas that dehumanize and threaten life and liberty. We call out the sins of racism and white supremacy and acknowledge our own complicity. Have mercy, forgive us. Change our hearts and minds and actions this day. We pray for those who suffer in ways that are unacknowledged in the din of the news around this pandemic. Give us hearts to continue to bear witness. As we wrestle with the pandemics of COVID-19 and racial injustice, we seek your face, O oh God. Comfort those in isolation, in nursing homes and in hospice care. Be near to those with dementia who cannot understand the absence of their loved ones. Comfort those who cannot go visit during this estrangement. As the academic year draws to a close, we thank you for the educators and those who have taught our young people for all their efforts. And we look toward an uncertain summer and we remember in particular parents of neuro non-conforming children who are struggling to support their, their kids, often with few resources. Heal us, God, where we are sick and broken. Restore your hope. Renew our hearts. Reform our minds. Help us to see one another, each face bearing your image. And may we demonstrate the grace and compassion that you offer each of us to one another. We look to Jesus for the way to live and to pray, saying, Creator God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Good morning, church. Our reading for today is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. The armor of God. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fated with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasion with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Amen and thanks be to God. Amen. Last week, a friend said to me, she knew she hadn't given up hope yet because she was still flossing. Apparently, good oral hygiene is an indicator that one believes there will be a future. And yet, things are grim. 
This virus continues to claim lives and constrain our living. People are out of work and the veil has been pulled back once again on racist brutality in our country. In 2017, author and blogger Alexandria Rowland declared that the opposite of grimdark is hope punk. Pass it on. She highlighted the need for a counterbalance to prevailing narratives of selfishness and hopelessness. And as she describes it, hope punk exists both in fiction and in history, both in mythology and in our social environment. She considered both Jesus Christ and Martin Luther King Jr. to be examples of hope, hope punk. This past summer at the American Baptist Theologians Conference before our, annual, our biennial gathering, two of my colleagues, the Reverend Mindy Welton Mitchell and Reverend Paul Schneider delivered a paper called The Hope Punk Gospel, Weaponizing Optimism in Resistance to a Grim Dark World. And I think that paper was written for such a time as this. And they talk about how hope punk is focused on resistance through weaponized optimism, weaponized optimism. And the vocabulary of violence in this way is transformed into one of resistance, similar to the armor of God found in Ephesians 6, where this very martial imagery is transformed and flipped into something that is nonviolent and life-giving. In the midst of chaos, hope punk theology is built on the force of optimism arising from the work of Jesus. Grimdark, by contrast, refers, refers to the dystopian or apocalyptic genre that's been around since before the book of Revelation, but which is, has been an ascendancy in recent years in particular. You can see it in books and watch it in, on TV and on movies. And the whole premise of Grimdark is that the world is this brutal and busted place and it's getting worse where hopelessness and violence reign, where systems and structures continually fail and people are only looking out for themselves. And it comes in re reaction to a perceived grim, dark world. And recent news going around gives a lot of credence, credence to this idea. And hope punk itself grows out of the ideals of the punk movement. And today it's known best for the music that it engendered, but rest assured the punk movement goes far beyond oi, 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 and spiky hairdos. Because at its core, punk is resistance. It's resisting of cultural norms, the oppression of governments and societies that marginalize people. Punks were some of the most effective political activists of the 80s and 90s by setting their message to music and matching that with direct action in the streets. Aja Romano has noted that hope punk is marked by qualities of gentleness and kindness, the struggle to build positive social systems and community through cooperation rather than conflict. Hope punk makes being kind a political act, an act of rebellion in a world of cynicism and nihilism. This worldview values emotional self-awareness where showing vulnerability is accepted and encouraged and it asserts that anything that's worth fighting for is worth sacrificing for. Marvin McMickle defines a witness as someone who sees something, says something, and most critically, suffers for something. My colleague, the Reverend Travis Norvell, is the pastor of Judson Memorial Baptist in Minneapolis, and he has observed that right now people are, are seeing something and they're saying something, and this is important. But he says that in the past, we mostly just stopped there. We were content to be two thirds witnesses. And the challenge is to keep pushing forward. And for that, we, those of us with power and privilege, we're gonna need to suffer. We will need to change and transform and repent and, and, and metanoiaize because anything worth fighting for is worth sacrificing for. Because at this point, friends, we don't just need colleagues and allies, we need co-conspirators, people who are all in with skin in the game, literally. So don't just remain a, a two-thirds witness, but know, however, if you truly stand with the oppressed, you will be treated as the oppressed. Don't expect to be exalted for doing the right thing. Our neighbors are generous, we've got some music coming down the hill. It is good and it is necessary that people are calling for meaningful change in our systems and in our structures. So yes, 
do this. But we need also to take care lest our outward focus obscures our inner introspection. It's easy to call out the racism out there and it's a lot harder to recognize it or admit it in ourselves. But as Reverend Norvell assures us, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can work for structural change and do the inner work as well. I mean, case in point, a lot of people have talked about outside agitators coming to disrupt nonviolent protests and to foment hostility, and that's true. But if the, what if a lot of the people fomenting that hostility are from here? I read in the paper of the arrests made on the night of violence in Providence, only one was from out of state. What if most of our agitation is coming from the inside? According to the Southern Poverty Law Center, there's just as many white supremacist groups in Minnesota and Wisconsin as there are in Alabama and Georgia. And I see a lot of Confederate flags in Rhode Island. People don't wanna believe that their neighbors are white supremacists, just like the same neighbors don't wanna believe that they're racist. But the energy and the will for change is growing. And just as I am hopeful that those of us who've been given much can realize much is expected of us, that we will go beyond more than two thirds witnessing, I believe that another way is possible. But to be clear, this, 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 this way of being, hope punk, is not utopian. The way of Jesus isn't utopian. There, in, this, in the worldview of hope punk theology, there isn't always a happy ending. Rather, there's this understanding that struggle will always exist, and so will the courage and strength to meet it. Hope punk is the opposite of grim dark because it resists hopeless paradigms in the face of all evidence to the contrary. Brian Stevenson is a lawyer who works extensively with the Innocence Project to remove unjustly accused people from death row, and he says that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. The Zapatistas of Mexico put it slightly differently, reminding themselves and one another that joy is a weapon, one that is difficult to disarm. Last week, we talked about how one of the hallmarks of the Holy Spirit is joy. And so what does that mean for us? How do we incorporate this Holy Spirit joy into our daily life and struggle, even now? We keep honeybees in our backyard, and I love to watch them. I'll just sit there and watch them go about their work. And for bees, dance is integral to their work. How might that translate into your life? Nadia Tolokonikova spent years in a Russian prison in Siberia for protesting the lockstep relationship of the Russian Orthodox Church with the Russian government. And she's written in her book, Read and Riot, about wielding joy, urging smiles as acts of resistance, because smiling in Russia is an act of resistance. She says, laugh in the face of your wardens, seduce the hangman into your beliefs, make prison wardens your friends, Win the hearts of those who support the villain. Convince the police that they should be on your side. When the army refuses to shoot into a crowd of protesters, the revolution wins. When you see police kneeling around this country, kneeling for what's right alongside people standing up for their bodies and their lives, we see a movement taking place to bring this country together in a way that we have not seen before. In the book of Acts, both Peter and Paul go to jail and they endure threats and violence, rejections and divisions from within and without. And yet the early church remains hopeful, proclaiming that Jesus who was killed rose again. And even their jailers hear their hymns and their message and they believe. Filmmaker Guillermo del Toro writes that optimism is radical and it's a hard choice and it's the brave choice. And it seems to me, he says, most needed now. It's most needed now because history and fable have both proven that nothing is ever entirely lost. David can take Goliath. A beach in Normandy can turn the tide of war. Bravery can topple the powerful. And these facts are often seen as exceptional, he says, but they're not. Every day we all become the balance of our choices, choices between love and fear, belief and despair, because no hope is ever too small. And as Welton Mitchell and Schneider point out in their paper, hope punk exists in the idea of this now but not yet reign of God. It is already present in the acts of kindness and resistance to evil and empire that we see around us, and it is not yet present 
and that the world is still a flawed and broken place where terrible things will still happen. The very act of resistance itself, of striving to create that better world, even though it will never be the completely realized perfect world, is the heart of the Hope Punk story. The empire may have us surrounded, but we resist not with violence, but with hope, with love, gentleness, and kindness. We follow Jesus who told his disciples to put away the sword, who went willingly to the cross and who chose death as resistance rather than violence. In Jesus' death, he saved those he loved, every one of us. So what do you do? You listen, you show up. As Jane Kim wrote, you need to engage even when there's no performative component, even when no one is watching. We all need to actively learn and unlearn. We need to decolonize our minds and replace it with that which is life-giving for all of us. Don't just passively listen. Act. Vote. Be in community. We need one another more than ever. And we're finding new ways to foment that in these days. Our struggles aren't the same, but the root of our impression is in the same place. We can't let ourselves be pitted against one another. We can't fight this alone, and we are connected in more ways than we realize. Pardeep Singh Kaleka is the executive director of the Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee, and he says, we can't simply exist in states of mourning and prayer and longing for betterment. Our calling is to put our faith into action and to be prophetic in both encouragement and denouncement. And this is gonna require spiritual, honesty. This will require genuine empathy to see a stranger as we see a friend. This will require a compassionate soul to not be offended by the truth of another simply because it does not align with our own. This will require courage to be inconvenienced and maybe even alienated by those that we may love. This will require every moment to be a learning and growing moment. This will require commitment to action that stands up and denounces forces that invade the innate dignity of the individual, the family, and the society. Final word from Ephesians 6. Be strong in the Lord and in the Lord's mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so that you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the readiness to preach the good news of the peace of God. And in addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the evil one. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all of God's holy people. The opposite of grim dark is hope punk. Pass it on.
Jesus taught us that something holy happens when we share this meal and we remember him. The requirement for partaking in this feast is that you hunger and thirst after God and God's mercy and justice. We are united in this moment through the spirit of our living God. Church Beyond the Walls is a congregation that meets in a public park here in Providence and we use their invitation in this moment. This is Christ's table. So come, you who feel weak and unworthy, you who come often and you who have stayed away. Come, you who love Jesus and you who wish you could. Come, sinners and saints, women and men, gay and straight, cisgendered and trans. Come, you who are sober and you who aren't. Come, you who are houseless, and you who have a place to rest your head. Come, you who are citizens of this land, and you who are not. Here, you are citizens in the realm of God. Now join God's people at this feast prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Jesus said, I am the bread of life, and if you come to me, you will never hunger, and if you believe in me, you will never thirst. God, we thank you for your presence in each of the places we find ourselves this day. We thank you for opening yourself up in this meal by providing your presence within and around us to sustain and sweeten our lives. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, after giving thanks to God, he took some bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this and remember me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this and remember me. Friends, we do not eat this meal alone, and we ask that you share this feast that you have just enjoyed by donating to an organization dedicated to distributing food like Better Lives Rhode Island or other food banks in the area where you live. This is how we share in the body of Christ. Amen. And now, brothers and sisters, may the strength of God pilot you, the power of God uphold you, the wisdom of God guide you. May the eye of God look before you, the ear of God hear you, the word of God speak for you. May the hand of God protect you, the way of God lie before you, the shield of God defend you, the host of God save you. Amen and go in peace. And as you go, please share this peace with someone else by phone call, by letter, by message, make a connection to someone else and share what you have received this day.